Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, I am Daniel Steele, Director of Communications at Southville. I'm here today to serve as moderator for this interactive masterclass. Before we get started, we do have a few guidelines. Just so you know, all participants' webcams and microphones will be disabled. Questions will should be entered into the chat box, and we want your questions. This is all about being interactive as a session. So please send us your questions in the chat box and we will get to as many as we can in the time we have. Now, let me introduce today's speaker. Professor Peter Stokes is the Professor of Leadership and Professional Development in the Faculty of Business and Law at Leicester Castle Business School in De Montfort University. His broad career path spans four decades and comprises, among other roles, a tractor factory industrial apprenticeship, computer programming, IT management based in Paris, overseeing European marketing operations, sales management, business consultancy, and academic department and school leadership. He's applied his work in national and international knowledge transfer and consultancy projects across a range of business sectors, encompassing utilities, construction, publishing, aerospace, diplomatic bureau, mental health facilities, emergency and rescue services, and local government. He's published a rich and varied body of work in and reviewed extensively for world-class journals in the areas of, among others, human resource management, leadership values and behaviors, business ethics, management philosophy, organizational design, strategy, critical management studies, and research methodology. In addition, he's published books on research methods, postgraduate research, critical management studies, and organizational management. He is editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Organizational Analysis, associate editor of Journal of Creating Value, and serves on a number of international journal boards, including the Euromed Journal of Business and the Journal of Knowledge Management. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, let us all welcome Professor Peter Stokes. Professor, take it away. Hello, well, good morning and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Daniel, for that very generous introduction. And good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's good morning where I am in the UK and a very soggy, wet good morning here, but a positive one. Um, so I'm delighted to be with you today. Uh, and we're going to talk about the idea of what, what we do moving on from COVID, what will be different in COVID, and, uh, and, and, and reflecting really on some of the things. Now, the first thing I just want to get clear up is this uh, metaphor, this analogy of old wine in new bottles. And really what, I, what I'm asking there is, will, what will be different, really? What will be different? after COVID? That's one of the key questions I think we want to debate today. Um, will anything be different? Um, and, and above all, we might think about what we want or would wish to be different. So that's really where, where I am here to exchange ideas with you today um, uh, on that matter. Um, so I'm, I welcome any questions. And I don't know, Daniel, if we already have uh, any, any questions starting to uh, boil up appear in people's minds? Any pressing immediate questions? Well, um, I have one for you that I'd just like to start things off with. Uh, while everyone else is still thinking up their own questions, again, feel free to answer them into the chat box along the way. Um, you, you're saying we should be thinking about what will be different. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask a variation of that question, which is, what should be different? What should change after COVID? I, I, th I think one of the interesting things here is, is that we've been here before, but not everybody has. Let me explain. I'm, uh, uh, I'm what would be called by some definitions a late baby boomer, which means, you know, I'm 61. Um, so I was born in 1959, and I grew up in the in the uh, in the shadow, really, of the the end of the Second World War and the start of the Cold War. So, if you like, think about in your lifetime what uh, major events you've had to deal with. Now, different people have had to deal with different major events, and the fact is, think about what changed after those events. 
think about so you've all what i'm asking you to do is already draw on your experience because that's always the a great starting point for making sense of things um if we look back more generally you know about what happened after the something like the second world war or the end of the cold war um there there was a baby boom there there was a a growth of popular culture there was a change in culture there was a growth in consumerism that's very different to what happened and what should have happened which was daniel's question or what we think yeah. should happen so let's have a look at that what what is going to happen in my opinion this is my opinion there are many opinions in the room so we'll listen to a lot of them uh, I, I think we're going to return to many of our old ways. Uh, I actually think there's a massive nostalgia. I think that's a really interesting word. Massive nostalgia for pre-COVID life. We want to travel. We want to start, believe it or not, we want to go into meetings again. We want to, <laughs> you know, we actually want to go into a meeting with people again. We used to curse meetings, you know. Uh, but now we're fed up of looking at people in screens and we actually want to sit around a table with them again, want to travel. Uh, I, I do think the other word I'm going to introduce into the debate is hedonism. Hedonism. By that, I mean uh, the, the desire to have pleasure, the desire to enjoy yourself, the de desire to have all the nice things of life. Because at the moment, certainly in the UK, I'm not quite sure quite where you're up to with COVID in the Philippines. Uh, lockdown or whatever but in the UK we're still in our third lockdown here so all the pubs clubs uh, restaurants all, all the non-essential shops are shut so it's pretty dull actually you know it's pretty yeah. say it's pretty groundhog day every day we get up I get up and I work and then I eat and I go to bed um, there's not a lot else to do so that's what's happened what should happen of course is um, that, if you like, what I've just talked about was the pragmatism, was the reality, was just the everydayness of it. What we, if we move on to what should happen, maybe we're moving into a different realm, which is idealism. We, okay. we, we, want, to, we want to think more conceptually about what should be. You know, now here's an inter another interesting thought for you to think about is, I think that idealism is already happening with younger generations. When I look at the generation we call the millennials, when I look at the generation we call the Zs or whatever, Xs, whatever you want to call them, Zs, um, I already see that idealism operating in relation to ideas around sustainability, corporate social responsibility, et cetera. And they're living it. They're already living it. Um, the interesting thing is I don't think my generation is so much. Um, I think we've got our houses, we've got our careers, um, we care about the planet, but not as much as the younger generations are operationalizing. So idealistically, I think what's going to happen is I think a lot of people will realize that this has been a life-threatening event for them, a potentially life-threatening event, and for some people, actually a life-threatening event. Um, and, and I think some people will think, you know what? I realize this life is very precious and this time is very precious. And you know what? I was sort of thinking about doing this or putting something on hold. I'm actually going to do it. So I think you'll see a lot of uh, people taking risks of uh, adventures, of uh, entrepreneurial, of innovation, of just going out there. There might be quite a few failures. It might not work like in all risk taking and innovation. But I think you'll see some people just what we call carpe diem, mm -hmm. seizing the day, that from the Latin carpe diem, seize the day. Uh, and I, th I think you will see a lot of seizing the day behavior across a lot of generations actually, not just the young generation going on. But there you go, that's a, a, a quick set of thoughts on what will happen, in my opinion only, and what ought to happen or is likely to happen in terms of ideals and wishes. Jumping on top of that, um, you speak of hedonism, and you also speak of the fact that people are going to be, they, they have this sort of like this pent up 
carpe diem almost like I, I want to go and do things. I want to go take risks. I want the challenge. I, I want to get out of the house, right? It's that, yeah. that sense of, uh, of just stagnation uh, that, that is keeping people bottled up. And the, the drive to get outside of that um, is, of course, going to be a logistical nightmare for all kinds of uh, organizations and governments to deal with uh, as and when things do start to reopen. But getting beyond that, what kind of um, opportunities do you see happening with that kind of surge, that kind of boom in demand for, for example, um, hospitality or travel or um, even just uh, things like theme parks, you know, that, that, that sort of uh, life experience that you just can't get right now. Right. What, well, what, what, well, yeah, sorry, go on, Daniel. Sorry. No, no, please, please. Uh, just what, no, what I, 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 I just think, you know, I, I, I really do think that there's going to be um, the intense seeking of pleasure, the intense seeking of stimulus of human senses, uh, and that will be packaged up, commodified and sold, uh, as it always is, as product in some way. Uh, I also think there'll be a lot of identity work and a lot of identity travel, i.e. people going to find themselves. Um, now, uh, that's just the concept of it. Mm -hmm. um, someone's going to have to invent the products that deliver that. We already have a lot of them in right. adventure tourism and other things. Sure. But it could get, I think we could see a whole new swathe, a whole new domain of that opening up. I think one of the other things I'll throw into the mix for people to think about is one of the things that's going to change in the future is we've realized how rubbish IT is for running a virtual world. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is pretty good. You know, we couldn't have done this 20, 30, 40 years ago, but it's no replacement for sitting in a room with people and, 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 and getting the whole body language and the feel and, and, and being able to get up close and share a coffee together and offer them a coffee. And, and that whole thing about community and hospitality, that whether it's business or pleasure. So, you know, and we also know that, you know, connections fail, yeah. the sound's not very good, people are on mute, you know, uh, that must be the saying of 2020, you're on mute. Um, <laughs> You know, yeah. that is the saying of 2020, I think. So, so you know, one of the things we've realized is, I think, uh, picking up on your thoughts, there is a revolution, a new revolution of technology uh, being pointed at. Um, um, you know, we were talking about Silicon Valley earlier. You know, Silicon Valley are already thinking about things way into the future, but they've probably been energized and ca had a catalytic effect. I think, blimey, we really do need to get this technology up. So for example, one of the things we might end up with in the future, and I think we're probably fairly close to it, is we will have holo hologram communication. So essentially, you and I will actually be sitting in 3D projections in chairs talking to each other. So as we can actually see each other. It's almost a replacement um, for, for that. So we can see body language. and We haven't got smell and, and sense and, and all the rest of it, but and we can't touch, of course, but uh, you can't shake hands or anything. But maybe the technology can even replace that, you know. So I think what we've learned is that um, a load of people before COVID were talking about the world needs to shift to online teaching and online courses and all this sort of thing. And that already existed. We know that. But there was a big push saying, oh, we need to do more of this. And we, we always hesitated. I think now we know one of the reasons why we hesitated because actually being taught all the time online is a challenging experience and it needs a lot of energy from both parties. Yeah, and it's the kind of thing, I mean, gosh, we're, we're a year into this, this pandemic. We're, we're a year into, into these lockdowns at this point. And I, I, I think we've, we've seen people, yes, there, there was pe people have gotten beaten down by it. People have also started to get excited now that the uh, vaccines are coming out, but then people are still worried because it keeps mutating, right? So we don't know when or how this is gonna go away. There's this, this constant sort of thread of uncertainty of even will it go away? Or is this just what we're stuck with? 
how, how, how do you think organizations and governments can work to, one, prepare for reopening effectively, and two, um, ensure that it is done in a way that does not damage public health, of course, and is um, not at the same time damaging to, any more damaging to the economy than it already has been. Because frankly, so many sectors have taken such massive hits from this that you know, it, it's, it's frankly amazing that some, some industries have survived at this point. If we look at industries like air travel, if we look at industries like uh, yeah. hospitality, I mean, the, the number of, of businesses that have had to shutter operations or uh, vastly curtail their operations um, is, is staggering. I mean, the, the economic costs, um, the opportunity costs of this lost year, right? Um, how, how do we dig ourselves out of that? And how do governments in particular uh, start that process in, in a orderly manner? Because I'm, I'm just remembering last year uh, in, gosh, what was it, June or July, uh, when there was some, for some reason in the United States, they thought, hey, things are getting better. We should reopen everything. And uh, that was a catastrophic failure uh, that led to a meteoric rise in cases and uh, forced everything to close down that much more thoroughly than it had previously. And I, I think we've, we've seen this sort of lurching effect, right, back and forth where com- countries start to reopen and then there's a surge of cases and then they have to shut down. You said yourself, UK is on its third lockdown at this point. And mm-hmm. it seems like the case numbers never seem to go down. They're just going up and up and up. Every, every time there's a lockdown, it's because there's yet more new cases. It it's just keeps growing. So what can, what can governments do? What can organizations do to prepare for, for the real reopening, that, that true reopening that we're all yearning for? I, I think one of the interesting things is that when you're trying to make action, if, we, if you and I were the prime ministers of countries, um, if we're ever trying to do action, there's, uh, it's a complex thing because um, we're, trying to, we're trying to achieve action through other people, through other agencies, through other uh, structures, through power lines. And, you know, uh, if you've ever had, you know, anybody here who's ever had a, 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 a sort of a, a dean, a managing director, a big job, uh, an ambassador, or whatever, some big job or, you know, a director type job, you know that when you try and pull the levers to get something to happen, it doesn't necessarily move the things in the way you thought it was going to move them, or it doesn't even move them at all. And so, you know, this idea of the person at the top being omnipotent and all powerful and just raising their hand and everything happens. That's not how leadership happens. It's incredibly yeah. frustrating yeah. trying to get make things happen in the way you'd like mm-hmm. to see them happen. It's incredibly difficult. But that's the first thing to say. I think the other thing is that most governments are trying to use historical past to project mm-hmm. to new future. So, but the thing is, in living memory, not many people have um, uh, uh, maybe a similar crisis. In the, you know, our, our last one was the 1918 Spanish flu. Yeah. So the 1918 Spanish flu crisis had a lot of fatalities uh, and, and was managed. But nobody is alive who, who managed that and lived it. It's all written accounts if they existed. The only things we've got in our recent thing are like things like financial. We've all got our financial crashes, natural mm-hmm. disasters, mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, in the case of Britain, Brexit, um, which is an unfolding story as we see. And, 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 and as a British, a person who's British and Irish, uh, I speak with a vested interest in that process. Um, so, so this is the interesting thing about using experience, crisis experiences to try and understand and, and predict the future. Um, now, I think what often happens also with, you talked about governments, is this tension between populism and rationalism. Uh, And you you alluded to that in in the way the United States uh, administration of that 
period of that time took a decision which turned out, you said, catastrophically. So did the British administration. And I think they took decisions on populism. Um, and that's always a danger when you get politicians taking decisions. Uh, not all politicians will take decisions based on rational means. They also want to get elected or they don't want to lose power. Um, so that's always a problem in any country. So this time round, for example, in Britain, I think we see Boris Johnson very much talking about following the data, following the data. So he's listening this time to the scientific data. And it is only when, for example, that the uh, new infection rates, the death rates and all the other stats start to fall between below a certain threshold that he will open up again certain things. So I think you've got that tension going on in that decision making about certainty. Let's go on to what you raised about certainty and uncertainty. The fact is everybody, or not everybody, um, because if you're in the SAS and, uh, uh, you, you know, or special forces anywhere in the world, you love uncertainty, you love challenge. However, that's not true. Everybody does love certainty and everybody tries to plan to ensure that everything they can work out is worked out. We all try to nail down everything we can as safely as we can within the possibilities we have. So, um, um, so you know, what I would say is in a natural, for me personally, an opinion, and I'd welcome people's view on this, I think a lot of people naturally want certainty. They don't welcome uncertainty yeah. in their life. Well, sometimes we like variety, and we like change, but we don't like uncertainty, even variety and change. We like to have it slightly programmed, like we, we orchestrated it. We decided to have it. We went on holiday. We had some adventures on holiday. We're in control, really. So we don't like uncertainty, but here's the truth, and I'm really sorry to have to share this with you. Life is uncertain. I could be dead tomorrow. I'm not planning on it. But it could happen because life is uncertain for human beings. Events are uncertain. Um, you know, so I think one of the things we can do is, and I do this all the time, is to accept uncertainty. I am a professor. I worked very hard to get there. I started as a, a, an apprentice, as Daniel pointed out, an apprentice on a tractor factory shop floor, two, two years assembling tractors. So I came from a very different place to become a professor. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I now have a nice house and, and, and I have a family and everything's great. And I'm very grateful, um, you know, for all of that to, to the power, to, 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 to God and all that sort of uh, thought. Um, but I always accept that that could be stripped away from me in an instant. I never wake up with the mindset that that is to be taken for granted or could be permanent, or I'm sorted out, or I'm comfortable, or I'm safe. I never, ever, ever, I walk around permanently in control, but waiting for change. So I enjoy the moment. I enjoy things while, while I have them. Carpe diem. I really do enjoy why I have them. Uh, I expect change. Now, one of the philosophies when I'm talking in a classroom, I used to try and convey that idea is, uh, I won't go into detail in here, I'll just raise it so you can go and look it up if you're interested, is postmodernism. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've done a lot of reading into French philosophy of post-structuralism, postmodernism, deconstructionism, there's an awful lot of them. And I find them quite valuable in challenging some of the, well, I think sometimes foolish certainties that people carry around with them. There you go. Um, I, I hope that's prompted some thought in people's heads and uh, it, some questions, possibly. We, we, we have a question uh, from an audience member. Jaira is asking, how would you prepare yourself to be able to react to change? Yeah. You know, Jaira, all change starts with you anyway, because the key thing you've got is your mindset. Now, if you look at top sports people, if you look at top adventurers, whether they're going to the Arctic or sailing across the Atlantic, if you look at elite soldiers like special forces like the SAS or the SBS or whatever, you know, the key thing they have to prepare themselves for change and uncertainty 
is the state of their mind. And it, you always have that choice to decide what mindset you're going to have. Some people find that easier than others. Um, I can think of people I know who, when confronted with a crisis, find it very difficult to stop thinking about the crisis and are completely influenced by it and completely thrown by it and completely upset by it. When I'm hit by a crisis, I divide the world up into three things. What I can control, what I can't control completely, but might be able to influence, and what I cannot control at all. And I focus on the what I can control. And I take action on that. So I choose the things I'm going to do there. And, and I do action on that. The things I can't control completely, I decide what I'm, how I'm going to engage with influencing and trying to steer with others those events and what my strategy is for doing that. I also decide how much emotion I'm going to put into that, how much energy and emotion I'm going to put into that. But at some point, I'll have a cutoff point and I'll divest like any good or bad investment. I'll stop attending meetings. I'll stop communicating. I'll withdraw from an initiative. I'll hand it over to somebody else. I'll go and do something else. The things I can't control, I create uh, uh, avoidance tactics. I build walls, metaphorical walls. So for example, um, you know, if, if there's something happening and you can't do anything about it, you know, maybe you can stand out of the way of the very large truck screaming towards you down the road. Maybe you have an opportunity to stand to the side a little bit rather than standing right in front of it. You know, an, an example there would be, um, you know, uh, uh, oh, I, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Say, you know, say someone... Is, you know, say you have a, a, a new law comes in as a result of COVID or something else, and it totally changes your business. Well, you really don't have a choice about that uh, unless you're going to do something illegal, which is a choice. I'm not recommending that, but I do recommend that there's a complete array of choices available. And some people would take illegal action to try and avoid things. That's the nature of the human condition. Um, but you have a choice about what you do. So, you know, if you can't avoid the law and the law is going to cause you a lot of problems, then you look for ways that you can build a wall or mitigate it. So maybe you can take measures which are going to soften the way the law will hit you. Maybe you can get out of the area that the law is going to hit and move on from that. Pull your energy into area where the law isn't going to hit. Maybe you can just hand it over to somebody else. Um, Maybe you can take the hit and rebuild yourself. But the truth is, the bottom line at the end of it is it's in your mind. And this points back to this thing about choice. A lot of people pretend they don't have choice, uh, but they always do. And as Jean-Paul Sartre, the French philosopher, who's an existentialist after the Second World War said, you know, it's an act of mauvaise foi, uh, bad faith, if we say we don't have choice, because you always do. It might be between two absolutely impossible options, but you always have choice. Uh, and the state of mind you adopt towards that. I'll give you an example to finish off my, my contribution at this point. Uh, I, I'm very persuaded by the writings of uh, Viktor Frankl. Uh, that's F-R-A-N-K-L. Uh, Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychotherapist. He was Jewish. He was uh, arrested by the Nazis during the Second World War and sent to Auschwitz. He survived Auschwitz remarkably. And afterwards, he developed a new philosophy called logotherapy, um, which was really about choice and the state of the human mind and taking responsibility for, for self and the world. And he writes about the camps. He writes about Auschwitz, the death camp. And he says, we who lived in the concentration camps remember the people who walked down the hut and gave away their last piece of bread to somebody else who needed it more. He said, I'm not pretending that they were common or there were many, but it did happen. And what it showed was that 
even in the face of the most adverse and dire circumstances, the last of the human freedoms, the most important, still remains. And that is the freedom to choose one's own destiny and attitude in the face of any circumstances. And he also pointed out that every minute, every day, every micro moment in that day offered choices, constant choices. It wasn't just big choices, it's little choices all the time. And I've written about this. Um, and those little choices, you know, point up who you are. They start to construct who you are. And he talks about that many people in Auschwitz became just the typical inmates. But some of them, because they managed to keep their state of mind, their choice, they remained intact, integral human beings who were still, while oppressed, while crushed, while beaten, still had character and identity and were exercising decisions and the power to have choice. So that's an extreme example of seeing choice in operation. But I see choice every day. I see choice every day in offices, in homes, on streets, and in shops. We always have choice. All right, we, we have uh, more audience questions, and one I okay. think is quite an interesting follow-up. It's almost the flip side of this. Um, what is your take on certain populations' stubbornness or denial of the COVID-19 safety protocols and of the virus itself? I mean, once again, we're talking about choice. This is the choice um, against collectivism. This is the choice against the public good as larger society has, uh, has objectively identified it. And yet uh, those, are, those are choices that millions of people are making every single day. So what, yeah. what's your take on, on that? Well, the first thing is I, I don't leap in to look at the, the actual issue happening. Let's look at the conceptual underpinning of the issue and the conceptual underpinning is about the whole concept we've debated for hundreds of years if not thousands of years about the rights and responsibilities of civilization and the rights and responsibilities of human beings between each other and for each other and also freedom of choice and freedom of speech now i'm a libertarian i'm a meritocrat i'm an egalitarian so I believe in freedom of speech. I might not always like what people are saying. I might not always like what they're doing. I often don't. Um, but I defend, as Voltaire, the uh, philosopher in the 1600s said, I do not agree with your argument at all. But I defend to the death your right to hold that argument. So... You know, um, and it is by arguing with people, by debating with people, by producing evidence uh, to counter people's arguments that we overthrow them. Now, we know how hard it is to change people's minds. I, you know, my personal view is I, 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 I actually know some people who are questioning, you know, things about the vaccine. Uh, my wife and I have seen some old friends of ours writing some what we think is pretty foolish stuff on social media. Mm -hmm. um, these people are actually, uh, you know, have several degrees, are well read. So you think, how on earth can you actually come to a rational, something that you think is rational? But, you know, people do. Um, so I have to respect that they've arrived at that point, but I don't agree with them. And I would argue to the nth degree that they are wrong. The major problem, of course, is the consequences of that belief, that it might affect some people's actions. And the fact that some people haven't had the vaccine might actually contaminate some people. And that is a problem. But the problem is, it's like there's a big free speech debate going on at the moment. Um, uh, in, in Britain, in universities, is the problem is if you start to bring in laws or you start to try and uh, uh, legislate to control people's behaviours, you might not realise it, but you're actually slipping towards a, a totalitarian police type controlled state where the state decides what's allowed and what's not. So we do need, if we're going to have humanity and democracy and we're going to believe in these ideas or work towards them, we think they're valuable ideas, then 
then we 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 need to stay open minded, but be prepared to argue with evidence against people, um, and as much as possible stop the real consequence of their actions. But above all, we we shouldn't just slam them down and shut them down and, and lock mm. them up. Um, uh, I think that's that's an equal madness would be my starting point on that. Okay. With that in mind, just 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 as a follow up, I mean we we live in a world today where we have public health rules in place like quarantine restrictions, that sort of thing, that are controlling the flow of people and goods and, and everything seemingly in, in every country in the world. If that is acceptable and not seen as uh, an, an unacceptable curtailment of personal freedom, um, just just um, go, getting away from freedom of speech because I I, I think we're we're on the same page there. And, uh, but in terms of, of personal freedom of action, personal freedom of action when it has immediate, I mean, we're we're talking about you know people who who uh, to, to just to give a representative example, this could be someone who knows they have COVID, walking outside without a mask, going to a grocery store and coughing on people purposefully. There are people who have done this. Well, and you know, it, it depends what, on the what, law. Right. What, what, what kind of, of, of consequences are, are justified? Well, uh, as what, you see, the, the interesting thing is it depends on the law of the land, doesn't it? Well, because yeah, dif different, different countries, have now in Britain, if somebody did that, that would actually be assault. Hmm. You are actually, okay. in Britain, you would be guilty of assault. Um, so it's, you're it's, criminal. it's criminal. You don't actually have to touch anybody in Britain to commit assault. You know, we British, we're very gentle people. So you don't have to actually hit people to commit assault, you know? Um, it's not like other places. Um, so, you know, and, and so coughing on somebody in a violent way to try and cause harm would lead to uh, the police involvement in that. Um, so yeah, clearly there are limits. It's the same with HIV. If you remember HIV, uh, there were people uh, continuing to have relationships with other people, not declaring the fact they had HIV, and they were infecting other people. Well, in Britain, we actually have uh, a law specifically against that now. So it is a criminal act uh, to, to, to do that. So clearly, I think, you know, this is about the boundaries between rights and responsibilities. And the interesting thing is somebody's rights often impinge on somebody's other else's rights. That's always a problem. Um, drawing the lines between those, it's not categorical. Sometimes we need the law involved. Sometimes we need reasonableness. Sometimes we need people to take responsibility for themselves. Um, you know, or sometimes we need to appeal to this very, very rare commodity called human common sense, um, which we believe is very common, but is in little evidence in my experience. Um, so, you know, uh, and some countries, by the way, you know, they they will have legal regimes which will take a, you know, the example you gave of someone deliberately walking into a store and coughing on somebody to make a point. You know, some regimes will, will have a legal regime which will take an extremely sharp and severe and rapid view on that. And we'll see that person uh, locked up uh, or, or charged. So it, it's very dependent. I think, you know, it's about the individual and it's about the legal system, really. I'm, I'm curious what you think will be the societal uh, longer term consequences of having lived through uh, these sorts of restrictions, of having lived through these curtailed freedoms. You, you talk about a period of, of nostalgia and hedonism uh, sort of immediately post COVID and, and I, I, can, I can understand that. Um, but once once people are all tired and 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 everything, are are we going to see people sort of primed for this sort of curtailment, or do you think people will? Uh, because I've I've never known a government that could take control that was then um, only too willing to give it up. Uh, uh, so do do you think we're going to see uh, a continuation of uh, these kinds of um, uh, for the betterment of, you know, quote unquote, for the betterment of all uh, these sorts of restrictions and people just sort of 
accepting them as necessities that sort of uh, almost subconscious slide towards totalitarianism um, in, of course, not everywhere, but in, in some nations, just because people have already experienced this, they're already accustomed to the idea of follow the order, the lawful orders of the government and uh, don't question it, right? Because it's for the good of all. Do, do you see that happening? Or do you think there's going to be a really strong uh, backlash or so, something in between? What do you think? Uh, I, I think there'll be a variety across different countries of the world, you know. Um, I, I think some, some governments, depending on what they're doing, their predilection, will try and profit from the control they've secured during the COVID situation mm -hmm. and build on that mm -hmm. uh, in the spirit of public interest. Um, but actually, it might be actually just about coercion and control. I'm sure that will happen in some countries, and there'll be com conflict about that. Um, so, yeah, you know, as George Orwell said, and by the way, I had the pleasure of working at Massey Ferguson uh, Tractor Factory with George Orwell's son. Uh, uh, yeah, he worked there, believe it or not. He was his adopted son. Uh, but as George Orwell said in 1984 and Animal Farm, you know, um, we know the propensity of some um, bodies of people and government to try and seize power and oppress others. It's, it's not an unusual thing. Um, the other thing I think we will see happen, by the way, is a baby boom. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. You know, you know, well, I think we, we back, might have a new generation of baby boomers. It'll be you're going to have the COVID, COVID babies. There's yeah. going to be COVID yeah. babies. Or we'll have to probably think of a better name for it. Okay. Um, but a little bit like in the Second World War, um, you know, people returned back from the war and, and you know, the hostility stopped and certainty started and, and, and there was a massive baby boom as people started to rebuild their lives. So that rebuilding of people's lives will be going on. Don't forget that during uh, British history, recent British history in the 1970s, we had a three day week when we had power cuts and uh, industry was shut down for most of the week. Um, and it was the middle of winter. And basically, there was no TV because of no power. So um, let's just say people had to entertain themselves alternatively. And uh, you, there was a massive baby boom after the, the, the three day week. So I'm anticipating a baby boom with all the consequences that will mean for a new generation. Um, uh, the hedonism we talked about, people have already talked about it. Uh, we're, go we're going to have a, uh, the crazy 2020s, you know, like in the 1920s after the First World War. People are yep. already coining the phrase the crazy 2020s, like the 2020s are going to be a massive decade when people will go mad. But of course, remember what happened at the end of that exactly. period, the 1929 crash. Um, so that's just VUCA, that's just volatility, uncertainty, uh, chaos and complexity and ambiguity coming into action again. So that episode will go on, but there'll be another major event because these events seem to be happening more and more in the world. So I think that's a factor. I think the other thing that's going to happen is uh, a Marshall Plan. So after the Second World War in lots of countries to reconstruct we had a Marshall Plan led by the United States, which had, was the most wealthy country uh, at the time, so could underpin that, uh, rebuilding a lot of the European economies, which had been destroyed by war. Um, I, I, I think that Marshall Plan is already happening in some countries in Britain. Our public debt has, uh, I think, tripled. It's, got, it's gone mad and we just don't care. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because we're spending it to, to you know, for uh, support people in work, for mm -hmm. support mm -hmm. medical teams. It's like we're, we're like fighting a war at the moment again. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's what happens, you know, when you look at wars and, and things like that, or the, even the 208 crash, it, it throws the country into massive debt and we have to borrow lots of money, which then we have to manage the public finances and taxes be able to repay and that has big implications so we're going to see a lot of changes uh, in government in pension schemes in taxes uh, in other things where governments try and recoup money to to pay uh, but at the same time we're going to see big supply side economic supply side public uh, works projects infrastructure projects uh, in order to try and relaunch the economy get construction 
other sectors going, hospitality, etc. So it's, it's going to be an interesting time. Uh, I think the bankers will be rich again. Uh, they always are because uh, they'll be lending the money. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's some of the changes that are going to be going on. The, the interesting thing is, of course, you know, by the time that decade ends, for example, I'll be 70. Um, other people will be whatever age they're going to be. And my children will be 30 and 40. This is the fascinating thing about the generations who are going to live this decade. You know, my children are 25 and 23. And it's their decade, really. You know, it's the, it, yeah. if you're going to do anything crazy, you do it when you're young. You do the crazy stuff yeah. quite often when you're young. So they've, they've been put on hold. So there's going to be a whole load of young people wanting to do fairly crazy stuff. Um, and they're going to mature into that craziness. And that will have an implication for the societies that get built. All right. We have another question from a student, I think, nicely relevant here. Uh, this is coming from Tram. He says, uh, I'm intrigued with your talk's title, Old Wine in New Bottles. How do we as students... Uh, contextualize this figurative phrase to our lives as we enter the corporate jungle, or I guess the hedonistic jungle that's uh, waiting for them on the other side of their graduation gown. Yeah. Sorry, who, who's the question from, Daniel? Tram. Tram. Hello, Tram. Yeah. Yeah, great question. The fact is, it's a metaphor, uh, which means it's an illusion about trying to explain an action uh, uh, through an illustration. So, when we use the expression uh, old wine in new bottles or new wine in old bottles, what we're meaning is mm -hmm. if I say I'm putting new wine in old bottles, I'm trying to pretend it's better than it is. My title is old wine in new bottles. So what I'm saying is it's going to be more of the same. It's going to be the old stuff again, but we're going to relabel it um, because maybe the old stuff wasn't selling so well. So, Basically, we're going to put a new label on the, the bottle. We're going to rebrand it. We're going to sell it. How does it affect your life? Well, what you're looking at really is a transition. And remember, we are constantly in transition. Um, like we're standing on a planet that's spinning around at an incredible rate, but you don't realize it. You know, you don't feel that spinning around all the time. Well, think about that equally about economies about uh, change in society and governments, especially during something like COVID. You're not actually feeling the changes sometimes, but they're almost imperceptible. Some of them are immediate, visible and palpable and very powerful and obvious around you. They're a big event, um, uh, like the storming of uh, the White House, you know, uh, at the end of Trump's administration and all the implications mm -hmm. that had for uh, not just American democracy, but for democracy everywhere and made everybody think. But the imperceptible everyday little changes, the micro moments of change. And, and that's where old wine is going to play out for you because you're going to be thinking gradually and progressively, what parts of the old world do I want in my life? What parts of the old world work for me? What parts of what happened pre-COVID do I like and what do I want to move away from? Now, it won't be just you. <coughs> excuse me it won't be just you there'll be millions of people thinking like that so there'll be a movement there'll be a change but nobody's in control of that it's like an organic shifting gas really um and, and occasionally it crystallizes and coalesces into a moment a movement an episode or something and occasionally it's just drifting along um so that's what's going to happen to you um the interesting thing is you don't have to float along like that. You can actually take decisions about how you want to be, how you want to feel about things, how you want to see things within that world. You know, you can't, that's part of the things you can't control. So you just need to make choices about the things you can control. Talking about control and the fact that I, I think COVID has forced many of us to confront the uh, sort of collected illusion of control that is the modern world, right? We, we live in an ordered, structured society. We obey traffic laws. Uh, we, we buy our food at grocery stores. People are, by and large, in, in most nations, not starving. 
Um, we, we live in this world that we think is orderly and structured and we, we develop this, this deep-seated uh, expectation, this expectation of continuous order, continuous development, continuous prosperity. And I think COVID has been sort of this, it's not that we're waking up from a collective uh, fantasy so much as we've woken up to find ourselves in the nightmare that, that is the real world, which is that bad things happen. And of yeah. course, it, you know, this is, this is something individuals confront every day with, you know, a cancer diagnosis or being hit by a bus. But for society as a whole to face this, this, this once in a generation, once in a lifetime level of uh, crisis, what kind of implications do you think that will have for, you know, people going forward in terms of uh, risk taking? You know, will, will people look back on this and, and say, you know, 10 years from now, well, you know, it could be COVID and they're going to be sort of laissez-faire about risk taking? Or do you think people are going to have this sort of um, almost neurotic take and they'll, they'll, they'll cling to that, that, that concern of control and refuse to take risks, right? Where someone who was forced to become a shut-in during COVID stays a shut-in after COVID because they're afraid. The, the world has both. changed too much for them. Yeah, I think both. You know, some people are going to, as we said, they're going to become more risk, open to risk and adventure and realize that life is fragile, right? Life is delicate. Um, it can change in the blink of an eye. Uh, I think some other people will continue to be delusional, in my opinion, and will try and be conservative and keep what they want and guard what they have and protect their world. But unfortunately, the world will keep impinging on it. The world will keep throwing events at them that challenge that. Um, the danger there is they will become cynical uh, and depressed and fed up and, and jaundiced and, and, and a little bit moaning, you know. Um, it's so much better to ride the crest of the wave than be swimming in the middle of it. It's so much more fun. Um, it really is. I think that's the first thing. The other thing I'll say to you is, yes, I mean, you point about this... Um, accepting this assumption that life will just carry on. You know, one of the problems of capitalism uh, and the fact that our world is shaped through a modernistic, capitalistic world, and we don't have a lot of time to go through into a big analysis of that, is that we have always assumed that growth, economic growth, will be continuous. Well, why? Why? That's just an assumption. The fact we expect economies to grow by X percent per year is foolish. Uh, in fact, you know, zero growth might actually be less harmful to the world, to, to the economy, because growth means consuming more resources, more space, more, more and more. It's also damaging to people's lives and puts people into terrible stress, stress when they get targets and things. Oh, you know, you've got another big target to hit this year because we're increasing the sales target from last year by another 5%. And, you know, but the problem is we do have this inbuilt assumption that growth of any kind in any sphere, whether it's student performance, whether it's uh, banks making more returns, whether it's building more houses, goes on and on. And there is, if you're interested in this, there's a lot of zero growth movements mm. as part of ethics and responsibility. So you look at that. The other thing I'll say in response to it is that is Lorenz's thought from 1936 and that is, you know, we should always remember that the veneer, the thin covering of civilization is very thin. And if you don't believe that, well, just get yourself into a crisis situation and watch it fall apart. You know, I've been, I've been in mountaineering situations where I've watched people become very self-centered, very selfish, very quickly because they thought their lives were threatened and they've forgotten the rest of the team and they've needed a serious talking to. And I mean a serious talking to. Yeah. Look at New Orleans after the tornado. You know, uh, Katrina, it didn't take Hurricane much. Katrina, yeah. yeah. Hurricane Katrina. It didn't take much for civil order to break down. And, and that's quite common. So we must be, if we value humanity, if we value civilization, 
if we value the rights and responsibilities of others, we must be very mindful how fragile all this is, as you know, as well as our own fragility. In line with that, I think we have time for just one last question. Uh, this comes from Kay, who asks, uh, what is your opinion about people or businesses who are resistant to change? Well, so, some of them make a great career out of that. If you look at... <laughs> Uh, if you look at some company, but a lot of them don't succeed in pulling it off. If I just give you two examples of uh, uh, two companies that, that Morgan Cars in the UK, based in the UK, they make uh, uh, cars that look like vintage cars, but they're actually modern cars. And they have a waiting list of five years for their cars. Uh, and they're not sold to rich people. They're sold to enthusiasts. And they are so traditional, um, it's um, incredible. Uh, they are so traditional and they have survived because people it, love. It, isn't yeah. that the brand where the cars don't even have a fuel gauge? It might well be true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're, they're yeah. like so, <laughs> and people love it. But this is eccentricity. This is yeah. eccentricity. This is niche. This is eccentricity. Yeah. So people yeah. are buying that, you know. Another one is something like the, you know, uh, the Savoy Hotel in London or some other major institution like that, which, you know, has carried on traditions. There's a lot of traditions in Britain um, which have carried on. and been, But, you know, actually they have changed over the decades to cope with modern requirements. So, but most companies, you know, if you don't change in life as an individual, as a team, as an organization, you're probably going backwards. So if you don't change and you think you're standing still because you're not changing and that suits you, you're fooling yourself because life moves on, events move on, everything moves on. You're actually going backwards. And I say this to a lot of colleagues who keep doing the same thing and don't develop and don't develop new spheres and get new qualifications and do continued professional development. I say, you know, you do realize in seven years you're going to look very tired and out of date. You need to keep adding things to your skill bucket, to your skill thing, to your experience repertoire, your portfolio. Um, and I do, you know, recently I became a senior fellow of the Higher Educational Academy. I'm putting my application in for a principal fellowship. I'm 61, I'm a senior professor. You might say, well, you don't need that. Um, <laughs> true. But, you know, um, I, I just think it's so important to stay energized and keep going forward. And not like a mouse around a wheel in a, in a cage, like a, a, you know, no sense to you, be, be thoughtful, be mindful, think about the things you want to do, the impacts, et cetera, but keep developing, keep throwing new challenges. You know, one of the new challenges, and my old brain is really suffering with this, I'm learning Italian. I already speak fluent French and Spanish. And you will say, oh, well, Italian will be easy. Trust me, at 61, it's not. Um, but I, I'm throwing myself at that challenge. So I think it is about keeping yourself fresh. And above all, you know, you know, don't, don't become miserable and jaundiced and moaning at the world. Do something about it. Yeah, well, as you said, I mean, can, there are things that you can control. There are things that you can influence and there are things that you have no control over whatsoever. And being able to let go of those things or avoid those things that you cannot control, being able to take a step back as appropriate for the things that you can influence, uh, but maybe only to a, such a point, right? Not clinging too much to it, but then taking charge of the things that you can control, that personal development side of things. That if, I think if there's any lesson from, from today's session, it's that. There are things you can control. You can control your own actions. You can control your own path. And I think uh, if and any of the students who are watching this or any of the professionals who are watching this, uh, keep studying, keep learning, keep growing. I think that that is the lesson to take away from this because you're right, the world does not stand still. The world is just going to keep changing. And the demands uh, that are expected of each and every one of us will keep changing with it. So if you are standing still, if you are comfortable where you are, um, that is a short-sighted view. Yeah. Uh, enjoy it, you, but it won't last. <laughs> yeah, it, enjoy it, but 
don't don't expect it to last. Exactly, exactly. Um, all right. Um, do we have any last questions? We are just about at time. Does anyone have any final questions we want to ask? All right. I we don't have any more questions that have come in. So, um, oh wait, no, we do have one final question that has come in, which is uh, coming from Mark. He asked, what is your take on cognitive dissonance in terms of people refusing to accept change despite overwhelming evidence that their ideas are not totally correct? Are there ways to help them be more accepting of change, more accepting of, I guess, in this case, reality? Um, cognitive dissonance is a massive part of the human condition. Uh, I witness it every day of my life, as you do. Uh, in all sorts of ways, where people live in denial because they're not close to it. If I'm not close to the problem, it doesn't exist. Uh, if you want to understand cognitive dissonance, it, you know, one of the ways to think about it is like a, 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 in a military context is a bomber crew. You know, uh, uh, you know people can fly over a, a target, drop the bomb, but they never see the consequences of that bomb arriving on the ground, which can be pretty horrendous. Uh, to, to other human beings, but they don't see it. So it allows a distancing and it allows them to carry on the action. There's a lot of that. So one of the things to, that, that challenge cognitive dissonance is to present the consequences of actions to people. And an example of that is if you, in Britain, if you commit a speeding offence, if you drive too fast and get caught, you get given a choice. You can either pay the fine and get three points on your license, mm -hmm. or you can go on a speed awareness course. And on the speed awareness course, and you don't get points, so you don't get a fine, but you must go on the course. On the speed awareness course, which lasts a day, um, they show you some pretty horrendous photographs and some pretty horrendous films about the consequences of speeding. So mm -hmm. this is your actions, and this is what could happen from your actions. So be mindful. So that's one of the ways I think to combat cognitive dissonance is to remove the distance from the person that they're artificially putting there and show them the consequences of what can happen for their actions. Not always very easy, but uh, that's one way. All right. Um, I think we are out of time, uh, but Thank you very much, Professor Stokes, for taking the time to share your insights with us today. It was an incredibly fulfilling uh, interview experience, and I think all of our participants took away some very valuable life lessons, both for today and going forward into the future. So I hope this is something we might be able to do again in the future. We do have delighted. another. <laughs> yeah, we'd be delighted to have you again, once again. Um, we do actually have another of these uh, sessions coming up next Wednesday as well. So I hope people will consider joining that one. That is with Dr. William Marithi, um, also DMU, of course. Um, and so uh, we thank you again, Professor Stokes, for joining us. Thank you to all of the participants Pleasure. for joining, for giving your questions, for taking part in today's learning session on COVID-19, old wine and new bottles. We hope to see you next time. Uh, say, signing off, this is Daniel Steele. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you again. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, everyone.